Welcome back to, uh, to the Halflinger Podcast. Uh, I'm here with my dad, my mom, and Christy and myself. Uh, we got a very important episode uh, tonight about grief, reflecting on loss, healing, and moving forward after uh, traumatic events. So it's the four of us. Uh, my sister Julia is in London, and we actually, there's one other member of our family who's missing, my brother Brian. He, he died about 10 years ago. Um, and that's been one of the, probably the most important moment in our lives as a family and how we've moved on. So I thought tonight we were all together. We could uh, start off by talking about the night Brian died to give context mm -hmm. and move on from there. So I don't know who wants to start off. I think we'll let mom lead it off. Maybe she can set the stage for what happened that night. So uh, it was a cold not yet snowy night in February, early February. Um, it was a Friday, 2013. 2013. It was uh, a Friday night, and well, let's uh, back up for a sec. Let's let's talk about Brian for a second first. Okay. Of, of the person Brian was. So, you want to start? So maybe? Brian was our oldest, and um, he was a uh, very highly energetic, very intelligent, very very hardworking um, kid that had a very quirky sense of humor very athletic, um, loved his animals, um, loved um, having fun. And uh, he was a little bit on the shy side, but you wouldn't know that when you know, knew him well. Um, he had a huge respect for girls and, and didn't like them to get disrespected. Um, or any other kid for that matter. He was always kind of championing the underdog and he'd kind of use humor to stick up for people and distract people from picking on somebody or, or whatever, um, he a lot of times would use humor. Um, you guys have any other yeah, thoughts? Yeah, so he was 18 years old. Uh, he was a senior at Ottawa Hills. He was number two on the varsity golf team. Um, he loved playing basketball, loved sports as well. Uh, yeah, and so no, I think just to, just to give him some background on it and probably go some more from there. But so he was- well, so I think the most important thing about Brian was he was um, this really good kid. It was very respectful. Um, he never talked down to people. I mean, he had a lot. We have a lot. I'm a neurosurgeon. We're doctors. But he never went around bragging to people. He, he, you could have a million dollars or have two dollars. He didn't care. He treated everybody the same. Treated everybody nice. People really liked him. And, 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 and that showed after he died how many people really liked Brian and what they really thought of him. And so I think more than just his accomplishments was who he was in my mind. He was just a really good person who was um, very humble and never thought he was bigger than what he was. He had a huge um, appreciation for life and for what he had right. um, yeah. compared to others. Um, and he was kind of like a border collie. He, I consider it with his family and with his friends, kind of always rounding up the, the herd, kind of rounding everybody up to, to have some fun or cause a little bit of trouble or very 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 love to make people laugh yeah he's just had a very positive mindset too and you can see that in all of his writings and stuff he's done social media yeah. interactions with him so just a little context there and then mom if you wanted to jump back in. so it was a it was a cold february night on a friday february 2nd 2013 um we uh had come home from a, an appointment with Christy and we saw Brian and a couple of his friends leaving and we thought they were going to get Jimmy John's or something like that, like they do, did a lot. And we got ready to take Kevin, or Kevin went uh, to his JV basketball game. We, Christy went with us and we went to the basketball game, had a fun night at the basketball game. It was a theme yeah. night. Mm -hmm. It was called Hurt Night. So all the kids, um, it, you know, the, the high school kids were dressed like in doctor's outfits, scrubs, nurses, um, wearing um, braces on their legs or sitting in wheelchairs and, you know, just having a grand old time um, at the game, um, just having fun, supporting their team. And um, I took Kevin over to his friend Will's house and then the girls and I and a friend, Phoebe, went to get pizza. Brian went home and got kind of went, got ready for bed because he was on um, trauma call. Um, it was late, you know, it was after nine when the game ended. 
And I didn't see Brian after the game, but I knew he was he was going out with his friends. So we went and had pizza and came home and um, everybody settled in. And I actually went to bed early that night. And I, I texted Brian because the, the next night was a, a, like a Sadie oh, Hawkins. Yeah. It was turnabout, but it was like a Sadie Hawkins. It's like Calm Call Me, uh, but, um, but the girl asked the guy. It's a, yeah. dance, it's a school dance. In, in, in winter. And uh, I reminded him that he had to pick his flowers up before 3 o'clock because uh, the flower shop closed. And then I went to bed. I usually didn't go to bed. Not that I was ever worried about him um, because he never stayed out late. Um, and he he was always um, a you know, really good kid. But I was just tired. So I went to bed early that night, too. And then... And then um, somebody knocked on the door, and you you were in bed. And Ooh, Ju- hurt. Uh, well, somebody knocked on the door. And normally, well, we both I woke would, up, and I went down the answer went the down. doorbell. Yeah. And so it was wasn't it Brian's friends that were looking. It for was him? yeah, it was two of his friends that had been at the party, and they were looking for him. And they knocked on the door, and they said, "You know, you guys, have you seen Brian?" And and we said, "No." I mean, the last time we saw him was at the basketball game. So we said we thought you guys probably would know where he is. And they said, "No, he left the party, and nobody knows where he went." So obviously, as parents hearing that, we immediately got concerned. Well, it was concerned. weird because yeah. Brian was never, like they said, he was missing. And I was disoriented when I came down. I thought like they were in the basement or, mm-hmm. you know, I was just disoriented. And which is not, you know, I was like 1230 in the morning. 1230, 1245. And um, I said, wait, what do you mean Brian's missing? You know, Brian's yeah. never missing. And I and when by the time I realized how late it was, I started to kind of get worried. But yeah. In in essence, I already knew there's just something about things where you know, and I think it was already shock setting in because I was kind of in slow mo. Can't call somebody's house because you know nobody answers their phone at one o'clock in the morning. I was texting a couple of the kids, where's Brian? Where's Brian? Nobody was answering. Then I get a phone call. Right. And it was from um, one of the kids' mother, and she said to me, and I'm upstairs in the hallway by Christy and Julie in Julie's room. And she said, Cindy, um, there's been an accident. And I said, no, no, Margaret, there's been no accident. I, I just remember this is clear as day. Cause already I knew something was wrong, seriously wrong, but it hadn't really sunk in yet. I said, no, no, Margaret, there's been no accident. And she said, we can't find Brian and you need to have your husband call Toledo Hospital or St. Anne's, St. Right. Anne's. And Brian was on call that night. Right. So, um, you know, I was just kind of like, no, no, there's nothing wrong. So I hung up and I told Brian. And, um, so then, so that, you know, I was the neurosurgeon. I called for St. Anne's Hospital, which is a level three trauma for minor injuries. And I was also on call for other hospitals, but Toledo Hospital, which is a level one trauma center for life threatening injuries. And so we had heard he went to St. Anne's, so I, I figured he broke his leg because, you know, if you go to St. Anne's, it's going to be a minor injury. So that was a relief. And when I called St. Anne's, you know, I said, um, this is Dr. Hoplinger, everybody knows me there. And I said, can you tell me if my son Brian is there? And there's this big, long pause. So then I knew something's up, you know, what are they pausing for? So then I asked him again, I said, you know, this is Dr. Hoplinger, please tell me what's, is my son there and what's going on? And they said that, um, you know, Brian was here, but he's left now and they've, transferred him to Toledo Hospital. So so then your heart sinks, you know, because I knew Toledo Hospital, if he got transferred, it had to be a life-threatening injury. They would never move him out of that hospital to Toledo Hospital if there wasn't something life-threatening. So then, you know, that's when your heart sinks and you realize my life is probably changing now forever. Um, so then I'm trembling and my hand was trembling. I remember my heart was racing. It's just like a nightmare now and I can't even hardly hold the phone and my hand's shaking. And, and I called Toledo Hospital and that's where I, I am most of the time and everybody knows from Toledo Hospital. And I called the emergency department. I said, this is Dr. Hoplinger. And I said, can you tell me if my son Brian is there? And, um, you know, no one no one would tell me anything. They, they, they just said, you need to come to the hospital. And I said, you know, for God's sake, you know, I'm his dad's Brian Hoplinger. Can you please tell me what's going on with my son? And, um, you know, no one, no one would tell me. They just said, you need to come to the hospital. And so I knew at that point that no one would talk to me. There was only one reason that Brian was either dead or he was severely injured and so that was worst feeling in my life ever and um 
I, I turned to Cindy, you know, we were going to drive to the hospital and um, the kids, Cindy had a sitter come over the kids right away and Kevin was in another person's house. And, and so we, we drove to the hospital. And Well, you came down to the kitchen then and you said to me after you had hung the phone up, you said, Cindy, he's gone. And maybe that's a good thing. And we, um, there was no more discussion. We both knew what that meant. But, you know, we, we drove. It was a cold night. I remember driving to the hospital. I went in the back then 24 hours ago. And we had a, a discussion on the way over because, you know, we were really praying that he was dead because I, I didn't want my son to be somebody who has a bad head injury and be, a, you know, what people term a vegetable lying around in a nursing home. I went through that with my brother and I didn't want that for Brian. And so we, we really, as bad as that sounds, we were hoping he was dead and not severely maimed and injured. To lie around the rest of his life and when we got there um dr judd who was the attending trauma surgeon he's friends with us and you know when we got out of the car we could tell we saw the look on his face but he he turned to us and said that you know brian's dead and cindy started crying and he gave, i just he gave i a said big hug. i said um how, no how could it be brian he's such a good boy it can't be brian because it's all coming at you at once and I knew he was dead and I knew it had to have been something. I just didn't know what it was, but and I I just knew. And yeah. I, well, it's not real. I mean, you know, it's like, it wasn't real to us. I, but um, he took us in, you know, and we walked in and saw Brian and I can give you my first impression and Cindy give you your impression, but it's to see your son lying there, just pale white. He had a sheet up to his neck. On um, a gurney. On a gurney in a, room, in a, in a dark room. In the room. middle of a room. Yeah. And just, to see your son lying there dead, there's no no description that is the most horrible. And it's it's like it's like a nightmare. It's like a nightmare you can't wake up from. And I'm sure some people have been through that too. But it's like it's like this nightmare that you're waking up to and you can't you can't stop it. And it's like the permanency of it. Like you know, I mean, I just saw him three hours ago, and now my son's lying there dead, and he'll never open his eyes and talk to me again. It's a horrible, horrible feeling. Well, he just looked like he was lying there sleeping too, because he he looked perfect and I went up and I touched his head and he never let me touch his hair and I, I you know put my hand across his hair and um, I was a medical examiner a deputy medical examiner and I saw many many car accidents we knew at that point it had been a car accident um, and some for some reason I had to look at his feet because um, if you're in a car accident we knew he had hit a tree um, and if you're in a car accident with an impact like that, you'll oftentimes see um, people's feet are there. The impact causes breakage of the bones and it goes all the way up to the hips sometimes. So I just had to see his feet and they were they were kind of maimed and turned to the side as the ankles were broken. And I knew then that he was gone for sure because he didn't look like he was totally dead because he just looked like he was sleeping. And I touched him and he was cold. And I know exactly why he was cold, but I said to you, he's so cold. Yeah. You know, Cindy turned to me and she said, you know, he's cold. And I said, I said, yes, Cindy, that's because he's dead. You know, and we weren't It's just thinking. so it's weird. Just, uh, we Here were doctors, we are, but we're doctors, parents. but we're parents. And yeah. it was like in slow motion and unreal and just really bizarre. Yeah. And, um, you know, Brian, when his car hit the tree, it, it, it exploded into flames and it was very amazing that he didn't have one burn on his body and we give credit to the firemen that went in and pulled him out of that car and risked their lives to get him out of that car before it exploded because he um, the impact had pushed his seat back he well, had the whole engine door. was up in his yeah. seat compartment so it was the, a horrible yeah. wreck it was really horrible. well because it was a direct impact yeah. with the tree and he had a two car uh two-door car so it pushed his seat back into the back mm -hmm. seat and they had to um Try to cut him out before he leaves he, the jaws away. Yeah, mm -hmm. probably. Mm -hmm. Multiple um, police um, responded to that. Well, yeah, it was like four or three or four different departments. Yeah, different police departments. So then our next decision was, you know, what do we do at this point? And we knew we had to go home and talk to the kids and see what they wanted to do. If they wanted to come back to the hospital. So we came home. And Kevin had come home from his friends. We woke everybody up. And, um, and I said, you know, we gathered him in, in an area in our house and, and I said that, you know, Brian's been in an accident and, and, and your brother's dead. And um, 
mind boggling. I don't know Do if they remember? can even remember. I remember exactly I what remember. each of them did. I mean, I Christy remember. ran away screaming, saying, it's, No, it's not. You're yeah, lying. You're lying. Wasn't, wasn't Uncle George already there? At no, that no, no, not at our house. And then, so we, okay. no, we, sat, we sat down. I remember you said Brian was Because I thought the same thing at first when I had to come home. You didn't want to come home. No, because I thought, you know, Brian and his friends were being stupid, like he. Broke his, broke his arm. Yeah. yeah, that's the first thing you don't think. Uh, like you watch TV shows all the time, you play video games, you do, you see movies, and um, death is very much compartmentalized in society to doctors, um, veterans, and other people. So, like, actually, someone being dead doesn't really make sense. Like, how does that? So, but as we sat down, and my dad said that all of a sudden something kind of clicked where I. And yeah, it felt like slow motion to me, but I, I was very numb to it because it kept building as we were waiting and all this is going on, that something way worse is going on. You can just feel that your life's forever changed, but you don't know how to process it at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and then I know Chris, did you want to say? Yeah, I was 11, so I think I even took it a lot different than Kevin did. How old were you? 15. 15. Yeah, so I was a sixth grader. Um, it's like I understood what death was. Um, and like my grandpa had died or like other people had died and I went to funerals or whatever but I remember my dad said that and yeah I ran away and I was like running around and I just kept saying like you're lying um, and I thought and I think that's just denial in general um, I, I mean yeah I could tr contribute some of it to my age but I think that's just denial but um, I remember this kid that we knew he had broken his leg a couple months before that, playing soccer, um, and so I was like, "Oh, it's just like that." Like Brian just broke his leg. Like same things I said. I was like, "Oh, Brian just broke his leg. Like we'll have to help him around with his cast and everything." And then my dad sat down. And I said that, and then my next reaction after being like, "No, you're lying," um, when they asked if we wanted to see him or whatever, I was like, "Oh, we need to, we need to go now." Like before he, I still before didn't. Grasp, he dies. Yeah, I didn't grasp that he was dead. Like we need to go so I can say goodbye. Like we have to hurry, but you know, see, like I, I, I knew, like I comprehended it, and that's why the first thing I thought is just my entire life, like you see your parents with their brothers and sisters, see so your aunts and uncles. I, the first thing I like, I was thinking about is just like our entire life. Yeah. Brian's not going to be there for any. It, it's kind of one of those things I guess people talk about when, um, when you die, like life flashes before your eyes, but. I felt like a lot of events go through my mind at once. So I felt very numb of that's all gone. And and then again, when we went to the hospital and uh, seeing Brian on the gurney, like I'll never forget that, like first seeing him. And then when you feel his super cold body, mm -hmm. you just never, I've never felt someone yeah. cold like that. So, cause I, I don't, you guys were obviously used to it. You guys have felt that. You never was like, used to it. I'm not you used never, to but it. But like, you never like feel it. I've never felt yeah. a dead person. Yeah, no, I know. So well, I, I you're 15, I think, I think my mind, cause the mind is crazy. I think my mind has like suppressed that, but I do remember remnants of like being in that room and just seeing, and it's like what you see on TV. Like he literally was like a white body with a sheet and his face, his face looked perfect. And I think I touched his face or touched his hair. Um, and my sister was like, Julia not touch him, like a lot near him. I think she. I remember the, the first thing when we walked in the hospital and walked down the hallways. I remember seeing uh, Brandon and Doctor Zachary, and they were both. Brandon was crying and he gave us a hug. Because so he that, was his age. So Doctor Zachary is my partner. So obviously somebody. I mean, they came. Both my partners came in and. And their wives. And their wives and. They were there be almost before us. But and I mean, Brandon just seeing other people. Friend. Yeah, Brandon and Brian were good friends. So seeing him there crying, that, that you know. Your mind almost just like you guys are doctors and being like taken aback that it's cold for a second. You know someone's dead and you understand it, but then it's not like super, super concrete. You're like hoping yeah. there's some like you're hoping life's like a movie where there's that one like right. sliver of hope. Or and you're then, like dreaming. Yeah, and then you see someone crying, and then you walk into the room and then that it's the the door is like concretely shut that Brian's dead. And then yeah. you know, we did the this a priest came and we did a send off, like I always remember that about yeah. the story of him going over a cliff. Yeah. And saying goodbye. Well, tell them the story. You remember it? I remember it. Okay. Yeah, I remember it. <laughs> okay. Wait. Sorry. Because we gathered around Brian. He had us all hold hands. Yeah, we gathered around Brian, and he had us all hold hands, and he said that um, Brian was like at the edge of a cliff on a journey, on a journey, and then he fell off. But 
like, don't worry, because Jesus caught him at the bottom, but, like, Jesus can't bring him all the way back up. He has him now, um, but he's, like, okay. He's in heaven. He's okay. Jesus has him. He's going to bring him back up. Did you guys, I don't know about you, but I just had this overwhelming sensation that that he was alive. And I'll tell you what, what I what I realized it was. And that we, I couldn't speak because he was speaking, the priest. But I wanted to say he's he's actually really alive. We got to get somebody in here to help him. But what I think it was was his spirit. I f- I almost felt like I could feel his spirit. He was there. It was so overwhelming and it was so real to me. But obviously he wasn't alive. But I think one of the worst things for me is that when I how your body stops you from doing certain things, and this is this I just always remember this because it was just, I've never had an episode like this, but. So I was calling one of my best friends, Bill, mm-hmm. and I was going to tell him that Brian died because he's very close with our family. And I tried to say it, I'll bet you at least five times I said Brian's and I could not say the word dead and I couldn't get it out. I hate that word. And my mind was blocking me and I just couldn't say it. And then, you know, he started guessing. He said, what's going on? Where are you? I was in the hospital. And he said, what happens? Is Brian dead or something? And I, then I could say it. But I could not say the word. I, my mind was blocking me. It was so painful. I don't know why. It's, just, it's like it, it's it like I had an expressive aphasia. To yeah. say the word dead because yeah. I'd have to call and I like about the death certificate or about um, um, the hospital bill or this or that, and I'd have to say that my son died. And I I I couldn't say the word died or yeah. dead. I would say he passed away. We lost him. Yeah. We lost him. Like, I remember the, the, my fr- I left my friend Will's house. I remember they were wondering what's going on. I remember when I, I remember texting him, Brian is dead. But I remember it, it's also you just. I remember when we waited to tell. We told Grandma the next day, yeah. and then telling other family. Just like you guys having to tell us, I you know you guys have talked about it. How painful it is then having to tell your kids that their older brother is dead, having to tell other people that then someone they knew or yeah. were close with is dead. Then it's like you're putting the hurt on them. Yeah, but you know what? You know what the amazing thing is, is that the news of his death because of social media was just really kicked in. Mm -hmm. It spread so fast, and some people had heard it on the police scanner the night before. Yeah, I had a friend that was going on a cruise. She used to do my hair. She was going on a cruise, and she was in Florida, and she um, heard it from her son. I mean, everybody just. The news yeah. spread like crazy. Yeah, it was it, became, it was everywhere. It became a massive story. I mean, it, it was it was a massive event in the community and all around. Um, Brian, he, he was interconnected with a lot of things and just our family and him. So so many people and just it, it's a very tragic event. Because uh, oh, I mean, died. everyone had blue hearts. So Brian was potentially going to go to North Carolina. So Carolina blue and just blue hearts on people's wrist. On uh, next school week, people had them all. They spray painted a rock, uh, spray painted the tree that he hit. Can I ask so you? that was Brian. That was Brian's first choice in college was University of um, North Carolina Chapel Hill. And so, we had just visited the week before. Yeah. So he three days after he died, we got his acceptance letter that he was accepted there. And he never knew that, but that's where he wanted to go. Mm-hmm. He's lame too. I applied. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but I was going to say something. Oh, I went to like an old girls Catholic school at that point and they had a junior high and high school and the next day even though like Brian went to Ottawa Hills which is just on the road and like all of them Kevin and Julie went to Ottawa Hills everyone there was like hugging me and there was a whole like church because the Catholic school there was a whole church service that day but because a lot of those seniors at the school I went to knew Brian and went, and to, school went to school with him when he went to St. Joe's so like it was all he was like all throughout the community at yeah. like different places. Yeah. Awesome. And so I think you know obviously part of this episode is going to be about grief, but the, you know so, so this is the first part of grief, right? For us was the shock. shock. It's just shock. It's like disbelief. disbelief. Everything sur- surreal. Everything surreal. The news, slow yeah. motion. That entire the next yeah. week at school was, and everything. I don't know. It was like for you to do surgery or something. He didn't well, no, work I, that week. Or, or whatever. Because I remember going to school and it, everything felt meaning. Like, going to school felt meaningless. Well, I, how, we spent long, the whole, I, I, oh, how long did you take off work? I just was curious. Two weeks. But, I mean, the first week was just about planning his funeral. I mean, if you ever have to pick out your son's casket or your child's casket and the clothes you're going to bury him in and 
and all the things you need to do, get a church ready and stuff. It's a horrible, horrible process. What I was and it's say, numbing. What I was gonna say is is because it traveled like wildfire because it was a young person and um you know it, it was tragic. Um people were already at our house when we got mm -hmm. home because we went to Julie's mm -hmm. quarter or it was like a playoff basketball game and she really wanted to go. When you have something so tragic happen so suddenly, so violently, you are grasping to hold on yeah. to your routine and your schedule. So she really, really wanted to go to the basketball game because what you had said, Brian had said something to her about it. They had talked about it. And, and it's just, you really want to go and do your yeah. routine. I mean, we literally got home at three o'clock in the morning. We slept till... We didn't Eight. sleep. Well, first of all, we didn't sleep. We were just up all we night. We laid with the girls. Yeah, Christy came in and wanted to know why Brian died. Day. and It was huh? late. Wait, what? Yeah. I don't know. Christy wanted to know if Brian I didn't go to bed until like 5 30. Yeah, I um, think no, we, we laid in bed. But we were up all night. Yeah, me and Julie were in Europe. We were laid in bed together, and then Kevin Kevin isolated immediately because. Yeah, I tried to get Kevin to come down with us because I really wanted to. told his aunt, she said to him the next day or a couple days later, you it's okay to cry, Kevin. Kevin told her, do you remember what you told her? No. No, Aunt Inga, I can't. I'm the oldest now. Oh, I, I, I don't know. That's that. what she told me. I know. I don't, I don't know if that's accurate. Okay. But, but anyway. That's, just like when you portray me in the, like how, how your thoughts of me in the book, that's not, I'm just, I've always been more, like I'm not going to all go lay in the bed together. That's not. Okay, I think that was. Yeah. But that Julie didn't. Was on the floor. I was probably. That didn't. To me, that I didn't find comfort in that. That wasn't going to make anything better for myself. Right. right. So we didn't respect it. I was scared. Right? Right? No, I know. So I, I just wanted to be um, by myself and process things. But anyways, but, to think that we got up and went at seven thirty or seven o'clock in the morning to a basketball game, and the minute we walked in, everybody knew. Um, yeah. Everybody was sad. Everybody came and approached us. Um, and people were crying. The girls on the basketball teams were crying. And then we mm -hmm. stopped at my mom's and told her, and it's a miracle she didn't hear about it because one of my good friends growing up is a farmer, and he said he heard it on in, in Michigan, and he heard it on the 5:30 a.m. news. Mm -hmm. wow. So they announced his name on the 5:30 a.m. news before I even had a chance to tell my own mother. Is that legal? Not I don't know, but to think he only he only died at one o'clock in the morning, and they were already on the five ten news. Right, you know how in news stories they usually like don't disclose the name for a while. Right, they want to wait. So anyway, or maybe he heard it and he didn't know it was Brian, but whatever. So then we got home from telling my mom probably around noon, one o'clock, and there were so many people here because everybody was just thinking about what if it would have been there. Well, they asked if they. Somebody came over at the door and they asked, would you mind if some people would come over today? And Everybody wants to see I think there must have been 100, 200 people who came over during the day. and Interact I, with you. And that's, it's yeah. like, it's it's very nice. But that's why sometimes when I've known people who have lost someone, it, everyone wants to like kind of t be in touch with you or interact with you in some way because they don't know what to do. Yeah. But it's, it, it is, it's overwhelming at times. They're I mean, even more so for you guys, probably, but for that entire next yeah. week or two. And Brian's friends came over and they wanted to go up in his room and see where, you know. Well, they come like over a, for a month afterwards yeah. and just go sit in his room. Sometimes, could you mind if I sit in his room and just um, process? Well, even explain, like, his showing, you know, like that was sort of big. Yeah, well, so um, my great-grandfather started a, a funeral home called Heffelinger Funeral Home. It's been around since 1875, but in the history of that funeral home, over 125, what was it, how many years? 1875, so 150 years. Um, that was, Brian's showing was the second largest ever of anybody who's ever gone to that funeral home. And, um, you know, we had probably 300 to 400 people easily each day, uh, maybe more. And we we would just stand, I mean, people would stand. Hours. I, I mean, say there was... People would stand in line for like three hours to see Brian. It was incredible. The we lines were backed the up show. in the front. Yeah, of the it was line. like twelve to eight both days, which is not normal. For yeah, me. and we. I would, think it was like twelve hundred people. Stand up. We would stand because, and I, I knew that I had to be present and I had to go through it because, this was like his graduation, his college graduation, his first, his marriage, his first baby, 
this was everything and every birthday all wrapped into one and we had to and this was the only time that we would see all these people to celebrate brian well and you want to like we had everything out you know you want to show people who brian was and we, we did all this stuff out to try to give you some to let them know who brian was that's all you want that's all you want is for people to know who brian was because it reminds you that he was a real person i think yeah you know you want people to know brian's real he's not he's a real person because you know was. once people die he they're was. gone and people like it's like he's not a real person anymore. He is a real person. Once someone's dead, like the only, the only your legacy is the only thing that's carried on. Your legacy is carried on through other people. Right. So nothing else. You don't keep anything else. So a small part of you lives on in those yeah. other people, and depending on the impact you made, it's those people who kind of carry that on. And I remember like Cindy wouldn't eat, and I remember the um, some women who would just come over to the house, help her get dressed, help her try to force feed her. You're like a zombie. You're like a zombie all week because it's just... Well, every time I tried to do anything, there was something else to do or somebody was interrupting or, you know, and, and it but was it's just so hard. Thing. Yeah, I, think, I mean, at one point, I think Jackie Zachary almost yeah. fed me. I think she did. I think the funeral, at least for me, I think the funeral like solidified things for me. Because even seeing him in the gurney that night, like, didn't feel real. But, like, then, like, in the middle of the day... Like he was just in a casket, and I think that just made it real. Well, what to realize, like, mm -hmm. so he had to have an autopsy done because it was a trauma, so that takes days. And then by the time he was showing, it's a week later, and you mm -hmm. know, skin was starting to deteriorate. And every night they'd have to put his makeup back on and stuff, and you could see it as the day wore on, the the makeup and the you, his skin was yeah. deteriorating. It was really well, he looked good, but it was bad. I mean. Huh? I mean, Christy keep making it, messing up his makeup by like. I was, was touch, I kept touching, kept touching his, his face. Yeah, so. I kept really touching it and it would like wipe off the like foundation or whatever type of moisture like makeup, makeup yeah. is. Because I remember it, it looked very like um not like orange but it looked like yeah, some type of, yeah it was some type of shade thick. yeah it was really thick and like it looked like him but it also didn't like not right. like the night which that actually we helped it. me because he said I he, like he forewarned me. He, like as if you would have to forewarn me, but you did, which was very kind and sweet. Cindy, now he's not going to look like he did at the hospital. Mm -hmm. And when I saw him, I, you know, yeah, he was dead and he looked dead. Mm -hmm. And that was actually easier because if he would have still looked so good, it would have been even yeah. harder to let go. But you talk about um, your legacy lives on. Um, the funny thing is, is we didn't have to tell people who Brian was no, because it amazed me that the person that we knew, he was that person to everybody. And I think a lot of times kids show different faces to family or to their friends or Just their humans teachers. Do that, yeah. yeah, to their teachers and their different people. Brian was the same person to everybody pretty mm -hmm. much. And I, I think that's pretty amazing. Um, but maybe that's a sign of the fact that he was going to leave early and it helped. I don't and, know. Yeah, and I think what happened too, for my perspective was like, you know, we, we had the funeral and that was huge. There was a, the whole church was just mm -hmm. jam packed standing room only. And there was five priests there because there were so many people. And um, I just, you, yeah. I remember them closing that casket. You know, we had that, he was in the church. We were the last ones to see him after everybody else saw him. And, and, um, just watching him close that casket was the final thing. It's just the finality of it was horrible because you're never going to see his face again. And then when they took him to the um, to where he's going to be buried, you know, where my family has been buried for a hundred years, um, just just that whole that whole episode, well, and then watch him, you know, lower the we stayed till they lowered the casket. It just it brings reality to it. But then it's like now what do we do? It's like you know yeah. that whole week here. <laughs> so busy but you're exhausted and then all of a sudden they close the casket and it's over and now now what do we do with our well, lives we like brian's gone and... reception for 700 people oh yeah i know but i'm just saying I know. it's like it, that's when grief really sets in because now now the depression like what are we going to do like, well, there's there's a whirlwind of things going on right. that keeps you kind of going it, yeah it's once it slows down a little bit that's where it gets way it, it kind of dips up for a bit at first after you go really low and then it goes way back down. I mean, there. it's almost like a climax. Like, I remember when they when we did the uh, the hearse, when the hearse went, I mean, they had police cars yeah. at all these lights <clears throat> everywhere until we got the, I mean, it was, so it was people. incredible. I mean, that's what I was going to say. That was, that I mean, was yeah, and there, It's like on TV. Movie. I mean, there, you know, usually you see a funeral go out by and people are just going one behind the other. I mean, they had police stations, police at car stations, every stop, stop stoplight and 
they held it and it was crazy. And so it's like all that build up and then it and then and then it's over. And now everybody and that scatters was actually and what do you do? A gift if if you can call it that, because I know somebody whose son well, actually he was with Brian and I he died. Somebody one of his friends died in twenty twenty. And he it was COVID, so he didn't even yeah. get to come home and they right. didn't have to have a a funeral for him and they didn't get the hoopla because right. he was already out of school for seven years and mm -hmm. I realized then what a gift it was that he had had such a wonderful that we had received so much love. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. wanted to say something, Christy? I don't remember. It was just something about like well when you come with the casket closing but like how was just remember you put your yeah, letter yeah so what did I put in there? A letter to Brian. Yeah. I remember letters. putting something in there yeah. and some people put like a spike someone put a spike, spike ball in. Yeah. It's a little drawer in the cast where you can put notes and stuff and then you can put whatever I thought you want it was kind of Somebody put a golf ball too. Yeah, it's just kind of cool. It's like a paper. So, yeah, that was all after Brian died that <laughs> the first couple of weeks, but especially that first week uh, from when he died and then the funeral next the next yeah. week. And sometime in between that time, and we'll get into this later in the episode, uh, it came out, uh, so he was under the influence of alcohol when he was driving. Um, so that came out, and that will tie in later with kind of the aftermath too of my brother's death and what we did as a family, what my parents did. Um, but so we'll get to that later. Um, I think what I want to do is kind of go forward from there, kind of what our experience is like. And each person, we can just take our time, but each person, what it was like immediately, kind of intermediately, like maybe a couple of years later, and then what it's like. Mm -hmm for you now and how you think life, if you think about life differently or how you think about grief, like really get into mm -hmm. each of us talking about grief. Yeah. And does anyone want to go first? Or do you want to I'll go. We'll go with that. Um, well, so, <clears throat> like pain and loss and everything is all relative. Um, so like, obviously if you compare my mom and I, she lost a son, I lost a brother. So like you would say like, oh, it's worse for her, but it's all relative. And I think also, I was at an age that I was so young that it was really during like a very important developmental phase. Um, but when he first died, I mean, I don't even, I don't even know how to like describe how I felt. I was just, I think it, it was different because we all lived together. We were all kids who lived together. It wasn't like losing your brother when you're like 23 or whatever and you don't live together. You know, Kevin and I lived together. But, um, so, I don't know, it was just weird because then, like, my oldest brother was gone and I feel like I got along a lot more at that time with Brian, or maybe not along, but I talked to him more than Kevin, um, or whatever. Um, and he was just always coming in, he was loud and, um, happy. And so then I think, like, our house was just really silent for a long time after, like, directly after. Um, and people kind of, we just, I don't know. And like I know there was a couple instances where we tried like family counseling, but like that didn't really go anywhere. Um, and then a couple years down the line, like once I started to approach high school and things like that, I kind of felt like my identity was always just like the girl whose brother died in like a drunk driving crash, or like I'd go to parties and it's like everyone tiptoed around because my brother died by drinking, or like not that I should have been drinking, but I'm just saying it was like always like it felt like there was a spotlight on me because I didn't have a lot of friends at that point who had like traumatic experiences or anything like that. Um, and then I remember like when it was a couple years down, I would always try, cause you start to, and I know you guys all agree, like you start to forget what they sound like or what their laugh sounds like, or even like what they look like. I mean, I don't forget what he looks like, but all you have is pictures. And I didn't really have a lot of, I had a lot, I had pictures with him and some of me with him, but I didn't really have like videos and I would always try to find videos to hear him like laugh. And I think there's a couple I have in this basement or like one on YouTube of the ping pong videos. Um, and I don't know, it was just, it was just hard because our whole family dynamic changes, obviously. And I think my parents, I just knew they were like, they were there for us, obviously, but it's just, there was like a piece of them missing um, from before. And um, just like Kevin being the oldest and that changed the dynamic and, um, I think it really just impacts how I grew up, um, and I think I'd be a completely different person if I didn't 
that didn't happen. And then now, um, I mean, I'm at the age where I've lived, I'm nearly at the age where I've lived more of my life without him than with him. And also, I don't really remember him when I was like one, two, three years old. But, um, so I don't know, it feels like he's so far away. But I just recently this year or this last year, I've gotten, I've been thinking about it more. Um, I used to have like a big portrait of him in my room, actually. I still have a little frame. But um, I think now with having my son, I think of him a lot. And I'm sad because I wish Archer could have met his Uncle Brian. Because I know like that would be so exciting. And just like seeing some of his friends, Brian's friends are getting married. Um, and I'm just like, oh, I wish I could go to his wedding or see um, him be an orthodontist or whatever he would have done. It's just weird to see all that happening. Um, I think of things like, like, who is Kevin's best man going to be? Or just like random stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, for me, I don't I don't know if it's a daily thing where I think of him, but I still just like comes around, especially with my baby. Yeah, that's all. Sorry if I went on too long. Yeah. Um, I think I looked at the first year as a year of just shock and um, you, it's just looking back, not at the time, but looking back, it's like things were in slow motion. You, not only did I um, not want to eat, sometimes when I ate it made me sick. I'd get stomach aches, I'd have diarrhea. Um, and that kind of surprised me, the, the visceral response, the response of your body to grief. Um, you know, not being able to sleep, I could understand, but um, all of that. Um, and just kind of only being able to do one thing at a time and not even really being able to do that well. Not being able to remember, just really not functioning. You're in shock. And um, it just isn't real and it affects your everything because... As a mother, you run through your mind all the time where your kids are. You know, okay, this one's here and this one's there and that one's not going to be home for dinner. And I was still cycling him through my mind and, he, and there was no new activities. It, you know, it's just, it's just, I guess that's a whole new brain pattern, as Julie would say. And I, it, I didn't like it. And I remember people talking about finding your new normal. And it made me very angry because... Um, I didn't want to find a new normal, and that implied maybe new sounded exciting, and it wasn't exciting. It was not good, and I didn't want to find it. So I look at the second year as when the really the sadness and grief hit, and when it really hurt really bad. So the second year for me was really much worse. And long story short, I'd say it took at least 10 years before I finally felt like maybe I was starting to put it behind me, nine years maybe, because um, it's one thing for you to deal with it and then you've gotta be helping your kids deal with it and they don't really, you can't help anybody deal with grief. You just, you, you can only be there and they, they have to deal with it themselves because there's no helping anybody. If there were, it would be great. Um, I remember friends asking me, well, you're, you're taking something, right? You're, you're on something for the depression, right? Well, why would I want to be on an antidepressant to numb my feelings and my emotions so that after I came off of that antidepressant, I could start feeling those emotions and grief all over again, not wanting to do that because I wasn't depressed. I was going through grief. Um, luckily, you guys were very busy. So it kept me very busy and kept my mind off things. I used to go into his room and shut the door and go in there with the dogs and cry. And, um, and then I couldn't breathe. Um, so then I'd have to, you know, it's just, it was a, just an ugly cycle. Um, and one thing I came to realize that I did have to find a new normal because we would have to find a new way of living. And... When I finally accepted that, it made things a little easier. Um, and the other thing that I realized is that I believe that God gives you an amazing ability to feel extreme pain and grief and loss, and at the same time feel happiness and joy for other things in your life. And I think that is an amazing thing. 
that we can feel both of them at the same time. Um, because I had a lot of, I still, I mean, even in the beginning, I had a lot of joy. I had three other children. I had a wonderful husband. Um, I had such great friends, and the community was incredibly supportive. And that I, I'm so grateful for, because they didn't have to be, and they were. Um, as I was told many, many times, it's every parent's nightmare. Yeah, I think everybody's totally different. Like, I, my overwhelming thing that first week and first two or three weeks was loneliness. Um, I remember just walking around the house. I couldn't sit still, and I'm just walking around the house, and you just, you're unsettled. You don't feel normal. Um, I feel like I was alone in the world, and even though all the kids were here and Cindy was here, it's like you're just alone. You feel alone. And, and I think that's probably part of where we all broke apart a little bit there was the loneliness because you're so lonely. You can't connect with people. I mean, that's how I felt. Um, and we we actually went to a counselor early on. Someone suggested we went to a counselor, and you know, this guy had told us that um, it was too early for us maybe, to be but, there. Well, but no, he didn't say that. He just yeah, said, he, he said you're going to go through a dark tunnel, and when you come out of that tunnel, you'll be different people. And you know, 90% of people get divorced. And I said, this is not what we need to hear right now. So I think we did it. We did it on our own. But I remember instances, things that stick in my mind. I remember we had a trip planned to go on vacation. We all scuba dived. And it was about, we already had this place run, and it was two or three months after Brian died. And we debated to go, but we said, why would we not go? It's paid for everything. And I remember trying to pack all our scuba stuff in the bags like I always do. And I, I just started crying. I couldn't do it, and it wouldn't fit right. Remember, I came to you and said, Cindy, I can't get this stuff in. And I was decompensating because I couldn't. Which is usually my job. Right. So it's just, it shows you what it do, does to you. And. Um, so I need, I needed a purpose, you know, and I, I, I stayed off work for two weeks and I went back to work at two weeks and then a little bit of time, a little bit of time. And I don't know how you guys felt, but like I'd be at work till noon and I had to come home. I mean, I, you know, I used to work till seven or eight o'clock at night and I, I couldn't be past noon. It's like a homing device. I had to come home well, to, to make where, sure everybody was okay. Well, and, and to where Brian lived because I needed to get home. I it just, it was calling me back to the house to be where everybody was and where Brian lived. And that went on for a month or two, I just, I had to get back. I just couldn't. You want to say something? I mean, that's okay. I have a genuine question. Like, being a doctor and you just want to go home, like, they let you, you know, just because of the circumstances? No, I would only book office till a certain a time uh -oh. because I knew that was happening. So, but oh, okay. even then, if the office was till two, there, there are days where I had to leave and I decided I had to cancel my office. I just had to do it. And I think everybody knew about Were it. Were you surgeries at that point? No. Uh, but I and started, everybody knew about it because yeah. and, and, you had people for years yeah. coming in telling you how sorry yeah. they were. They still do. I mean, I get people still to this day, 10 years later, coming and say, I'm so sorry about your son. You know, I, but um, but then then I yeah, I started back with trauma call, I think, three or four weeks after Brian died and started operating again. And it was hard. I mean, this is the whole thing is hard. Um, but then I needed a purpose, and I, you know, obviously Brian had been drinking that night, and, and Cindy and I took that whole issue head on about our son drinking. It wasn't the right thing to do, but you know, and kids make me. kids make a mistake. Yep. Um, but the way the media was portraying him, that he's a you know just a livid drunk who was out there with this high alcohol level, you know, just an irresponsible person. He was irresponsible that night because he was drunk, but he's not an irresponsible person. Brian was a good kid. He made good decisions, except for the nights, obviously, that he'd been drinking. So I, I knew I couldn't let that happen. So we, I called the local news station and I said, "Can would you guys want to do an interview with Cindy and I um, to really set the record straight? And, you know, we were very upfront about our son drinking and driving and, and, and we're dead set against it. And but also told the kind of person that Brian was. And, we, and, and then we knew that we had to do something with that. So for me, that was really about trying to help other people, you know, as most parents do when tragedy happens, to, to try to, to to reach other people, other parents, other kids about drinking and driving. And that's been an ongoing process for 10 years. And I think we've changed a lot of lives. And then I think I also, I needed something else. Like I, I needed to do something that Brian never got a chance to do. It was kind of how it was like, I remember the first three months in my car, I couldn't listen to the radio. I wouldn't turn the radio on because I couldn't, I couldn't listen to something that, that I usually would make me happy in the car. And so I couldn't do it because Brian couldn't be happy. I couldn't be happy. It's like you can't be happy because he's gone and doesn't have a chance to be happy. And then, 
And then I got into running and exercising and ultimately did an Ironman. And that was all about just trying to do things that I would have never done that maybe things that I can do that Brian doesn't have a chance to do. I, there's some element of that. Um, and I think, you know, as the, I don't have specific timelines. I mean, I remember we left Brian's room exactly the same way it was, where, his, where he left his book bag that day, where his shoes were lined up under his bed. We didn't, we didn't touch that room for, for years, I mean, years. Everything was exactly the same, his closet, his clothes, we didn't touch anything. And then years down the road, I, Cindy said, you know, we got to, so we gradually like moved his, moved his backpack and we, and we, and we, you know, changed some stuff in his room a little bit, just a little bit, little baby steps. Mm -hmm. And then we actually started moving some of the stuff out. That was like big time. But I think that's, for me, that's what the process of grief is. It takes a long time to, to accept it and to be ready. And then it's baby steps. And then eventually when we were ready, we moved all the stuff, Brian's bed out of the bedroom and stuff, and now it's an office. And his clothes are still hanging in the closet, a lot of them. But I mean, there comes a point where you have to like, it's kind of acceptance, you know, a little bit. And you can not, I'll never accept it. I mean, there's no accepting it. And and there's no getting over it. These people will say, you'll get over it. You know, it just takes time. It, it takes time, but it doesn't ever change the fact that Brian's not here. I mean, I remember how people talk a hole in your heart. It's like somebody ripped your heart out. And I can't describe that to you and you'll never, you'll never feel it, but there's always a part of you that's missing and you'll never get that back. And I remember walking around our nice house here and I'm a neurosurgeon and we do very well. And I was thinking I would be happy to give up everything I own. Your right arm, your legs, your eyes. I would give up everything I, I own went through the and I'd be a homeless if Brian came back. It's, it's, that's when you realize that money doesn't buy you things. Power doesn't buy you things. Stature doesn't buy you things. The only thing that buys you is having the ones you love around you. And, and that's when I learned that lesson the hardest way there is. You know, 10 years later, I mean, we can still get emotional here. I mean, everything is dulled, right? Like, I mean, the memory of Brian is there. I can't remember his voice. I remember the first time I said, I woke up one morning, I said, Cindy, I can't remember his voice. And that was a horrible feeling. I can kind of picture his face right now in my mind, but, you know, Brian's gone. Now you kind of focus on the on the good times, you don't remember the bad times as much. You can still get very emotional, but it's just never gone. There, there's not going to be a day in our lives. There might be a day now that goes by that maybe I forgot about Brian for a day. He's always But there. he's always there. It's always there, and you're never going to forget. And doesn't grief is the gift that gives forever. It's not you can't giving. you can't ever get over grief, but there's different levels of it and different ways to to cope with it. And everybody has a different coping mechanism. Mine, you know, my coping mechanism is much different than your guys probably. And I, 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 I did different things, you know, as, as Cindy maybe felt, I don't know, you're, you're much different than me. So I, I did things that were more, how do you want to put it? Like I, I got involved in things, you know, a cause proactive. proactive and Cindy is more about, how would you say? I mean, well, I'm usually the proactive one. But I became very, very reflective. Reflective and, and withdrawn a little bit. You, you, you I, were I much more withdrawn than you ever were. I mean, she's the outgoing one. She was more withdrawn. I was much more withdrawn, and I thought about things a lot. But I, it took me a long time to process it and go through everything and understand some kind of understanding. And there's no. It's it's just a lifetime process. We'll, this we'll live with this till I till I die. We'll live with this. Our kids will live with it till they die. And it's just the way it's going to be. And it's that's what I hated about the whole thing. It's the finality of it and the mm -hmm. permanency. When Brian died, it's like you can't take it back. And you know you had this wonderful life and this different life. And when Brian died, we were thrown into this over. new life that we didn't want. But we had to. We have to accept it because there's no going back. And so you have to just do what you can. You know? I think there was a lot of also um in the ocean so i think there was a lot of like what ifs scenarios trying to bargain no, no, sorry what no like what could have been yeah, yeah. I mean, well, you know, what the been regret been. of not also of not just being. like real quickly like i mean i didn't have coping mechanisms but into high school and i think at one point you guys felt this way because you told me like and i know like oh i know like no one actually did it or whatever, but I think everyone just mm -hmm. after a time just wanted to like die. Like, yeah. 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 No, but that's a real that's a I, real that's thing. A, that's I mean, sure. if we didn't have kids, if Cindy and I were didn't have kids except Brian, I think there would have been a good chance we would have. We we talked about you know well, this I is didn't, horrible. I mean, the pain is so yeah. bad you want to kill yourself. Yeah. It's it's mm -hmm. like you can't live with this pain. And obviously, 
you know, most people don't. But I'm saying it's a horrible pain. It's it wants, overwhelming. That's just how you it want feels. the pain it's to crushing. go away any way you can. Yeah. That's how you can sometimes. That's why it's not ever fair when someone says about suicide. You never can know. You have to be in a very, very dark place yeah. to do something like right. that. And it's not, it's not thinking straight. Right. No. It's not feeling. It's the pain. You want mental, the agony. That uh, it's the pain is feeling. so severe yeah. that you want to try to But even someone who probably, before Brian died, that would probably be the furthest thing from your mind is yeah. something like suicide. Oh, I thought suicide was a um, coward's way out. Yeah, but it all I changes once. Yeah, you know, it sure did. You, yeah, it's, yeah. it's way. Feel it yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Kevin. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so the first couple months, I would, yeah, are, are whirlwind. And at first, when there's just so much, you're not completely processed it, it's so fresh, and ever, there's so much support and outpouring that you kind of just get through those first couple months. And after the first couple months, is it, it gets much worse, I think. The, and there's such a mix of emotions of anger, sadness, um, all, all these things. Yeah, what ifs. Um, regret regret and everything else there's times anger at ourselves anger and for me anger at brian sometimes there was times where you wish yeah. it was very unrealistic but you wish somehow that you could have been the hero in a movie and gone over to the house somehow and been at the party and stopped brian you, you even it's very unrealistic um but yeah the, i remember the for the first after the first couple of weeks till like years later i would sometimes just um I'd like put music in, I'd look through pictures and videos of Brian and I, I would just cry so much. Um, and you go through it and early on, I remember going through school and I could, I could always get all my stuff done if I'm like going to school, doing homework, doing sports. I, will, I was always very, very good and I, I still think I am at being something when I don't feel that way. So I, I could still sit there and with friends and joke and stuff, but you feel dead inside a little bit mm -hmm. and you feel, it, it feels like you're pretend, like you're just pretending. Dissociated. Yeah. But, but not that because I, oh. but cause I like, I, I know what I'm doing because society, there's not this, everyone asks each other all the time, like, Hey, how are you doing? Everyone says yeah. you're good. You don't say like, I'm doing shit right now, actually. And like, I want to cry and I want to like, I don't want to do any of this, yeah. but, but you, I, you can't get, I, I don't think you can give into that because you have to just kind of slowly keep going. I me and my mom were talking about this on another episode, but some days all you have to do is just get through that day. Mm -hmm. you, no matter what you, an accomplishment early on is just getting through a day because it, it comes in waves. And I remember people always saying like time heals all. And mm -hmm. I remember it's more time kept going on. I don't, I don't think time heals all, and I still don't, and I, I'll talk to people. I think, uh, read this somewhere before, and I maybe extrapolated on it, but it's like if there's a box, and there's a trigger point inside that box with a ball, and over at first, that's going to hit your trigger point all the time. Like, you're, you're triggered a lot more. Like, you see someone else, like another person's kid or brother, that triggers, or something you would have done with Brian, mm -hmm. that triggers you a lot more, and over time, the instances of that those times coming up are less, but it hurts just as deeply every time those moments do come up. It hurts even over ten years later. I I still feel that there. I was at a wedding the other weekend, and I, just like Chris said, I saw, uh, you know, this guy's older brother was his best man. That stuff goes through my head, and and then that makes you. You're not going to start crying at this wedding, but that that makes you feel. Terrible inside because yeah. knowing that no matter what, your brother's never going to be your best man. Yeah. So, you know, it it really evolves over time, and I think somewhat like my dad too, like what he was saying. I would always think about things like Brian's dead now. Um, you'd want to honor his legacy. I would always want to, and I continuously do want to do things that he maybe couldn't get to do, or just to honor his legacy, just like with Brian Matters or spreading awareness at least to try to bring some purpose to him being gone because th that's all you can do when um someone's gone is you would hope that the people you've impacted in your life carry on your legacy and make an impact in your name um so so yeah you, you kind of just keep on going and i remember there there's a, a big moment i think in college where 
I was where I turned a little bit of a corner, and that that was like four or five years later, was when I decided that I I can sit there and think about Brian every day, and I do, and I would think about him all the time, and I, so many of those things would like hurt. At a certain point, you have to let yourself let go a little bit, and you, you feel guilty a little bit that you're letting go. Um, but in order to live your own life, you have to let go of the memory a little bit and not obsess over thinking about them or things like that. So you can live your own life and because you can't think about it 20, the more, if you think about it too much like that, no matter what, you're going to constantly put yourself in a depressive mood and you have to let yourself be happy um, and, and live your own life. And a lot, a lot of things come with that, but the biggest thing I think is just so many times interacting with other people is, this idea of, oh, you're so strong, you guys, what you went through. I, I, I wish we fucking weren't strong. I wish I never had to to go through that. I, I never felt strong. And I still don't feel strong from it um, because it just hurts and it sucks. And, and that does define your life. But the thing I always think about is you can let it, and I think you guys obviously talked about that, but you can let it something, major events in your life, they can either be the reason, like destroy you, or they can be the catalyst for great things. So, and that's something what Brian would always think and say, I think you can take the positive or negative view of anything. So trying to keep a glass half full view of the world. And I would say even so it's easier now, but you still take it one step at a time. There's, there's times we have a tree in our backyard. I'll, I'll go sit in front of the tree sometimes and think about Brian. Um, I, I mean, just in a month, I texted one of his good friends, Jimmy. Um, Cause you, no matter what, you just, you really do miss the person forevermore. And I, th I think grief is something you, you deal with for forever once you experience something. And that's your new perception of the world. And you try to just make something positive out of it. And, that's kind of just what I do. So. And one of the reasons we try to make something positive is because we knew that that's what he would have wanted. Yeah. And well, he would definitely. never have done this if he would have been thinking because <laughs> no one would willingly leave so much pain behind them. But, and I also think a lot of people ask, you know, like just how do you deal with grief and how do I deal with grief? And, and I've had a lot of people as patients come in and ask me about that, talk about Brian, how do I deal? They lost something. How do I, how did you do it? Like, how did you guys do so well to it? We, we didn't do well. It may look like it, but I'm just saying, I think grief, it's so individualized. There's not a right or wrong answer. You know, people give you all this advice, but until you've been through something, you never know. Nobody can tell you how you feel, but you. And so that's why I hate when people try to tell you how you should feel. It's all individual, and you have to do it at your own pace. Maybe I got through it quicker than Cindy or Kevin or Christy. I don't know, but everybody has to do it at their own pace, and there's not a right or wrong answer. And don't ever let people pressure you into like, well, you've had enough time now. You should feel better. You should really get out and start dating again, or you should really start doing this or that. You know, you do what you need to do, okay? But it's not up to other people to decide that. I mean, that's how that irks me so bad. I mean, it's such an individual process. I journey. feel like there was a moment in school like which i mean yeah people are I, you have to move on in your life at some point but i think after there was like a moment in school like right after we would miss school and the teachers were fine with or it late yeah we'd be late and then like three months down the line or well, however long not very long not very long i think they told me and my mom like she doesn't she doesn't get any more free passes like she's gotta come to school and it's like well, you missed a lot of school. Well, okay, I know. Yeah. Obviously, there's other things going around. But, but, I, but I, it's just, you know what I mean? Like, after however long, like, your job or whatever, yeah. people are, like, they're just going to stop. Well, one of the like, teachers gave somebody 50% off on a math test, and that teacher will remain unnamed. And I called the vice principal, and, I, and it was only, like, a month or two. It was Julie. Oh. And it, later, because she turned it in a day later or mm -hmm. something, and I remember calling Jackie and saying, you know something, this is, it'll never be okay. And there, this isn't that long. I said, they're going to be needing extra care for the next year or two, at least. And I said, this has only been a month or two. And to cut, not cut them any slack and act as if they're just going to be right up to snuff. It is ridiculous. Well, it's but funny too, you know, they bring all the counselors in for weeks after Brian died and, 
all the kids get counseling, which is a wonderful thing for a couple of weeks. But what about the person, the sister. sister, I mean, the sibling, they should be cut a little bit longer than that too. So Yeah, but I, to touch on what you said, I, I agree with that completely. Is That's the whole point of like talk people talking about grief and feelings. And like our hope is just showing people that there is no perfect way to deal with things. There is just only your way. And some things work for you, some things won't, but you just have to, you, you keep, you keep the going. Honest, it's just a true to yourself. Yeah. And you, you, you just, there is no figuring it out. You, you just keep going. You and just keep have to try. Try. And I do think also like utilize friends and stuff. Cause I think, you know, so there are people who will, will commit suicide when whole tragedies happen. And if you're out there like that and thinking that way, you know, try to tap into talking to people, just talking helps so much. It gets you out of that dark spot. You know, family was a huge family and friends were really, what really pulled us through. Just I think, being there. If you yeah, wonder what to having do, company. sometimes just listening to the person go on and on about their loved one, which gets hard, is hard. I know, but that's what they need. They need to talk about their loved one. Yeah. And they just need somebody to be there. And sometimes it's just being there. I'll start that with something. Just, with some yeah, if you're on the other me. end, yeah, you just have to be a good listener. Right? I still, I still, that's the only thing you do with some friends that you, Brian, or we're friends with Brian and me, just kind of talking about Brian or the good times we had. I mean, that's always just feels good. I mean, that's, that's all you have left anymore. Really, you know, so. I wanted to ask you guys if you felt this way. Like the first year or so, you know, everybody would be like, oh, how are you doing? Are you okay? Is it okay? Is everything? There came a point when I got sick of listening to myself whining and crying and no, everybody being sad. Yeah. At what? I usually, that, like, that's how I'm doing, especially the first I would change the subject. I was, I was a 15 year old male, so too. So I kept, I, you know, putting on a, I thought I could always handle it. So I would, you know, deal with it myself. I would put on a strong front in a way and I didn't want to, like, bring sadness and other things around. But I um, remember just being to the point where um, somebody would ask me and I, I would just say, you know what? Yeah, I, I'm doing better. Yeah. Because I didn't want them to always be looking at me, yeah, our no. friends, and go, oh, that's the poor woman whose son died. Yeah. And they always got to bring it up. And yeah, it's a label that, over your head. Yeah, not that they felt, I don't think that it was a burden to them <laughs> to bring it up. Okay. No, the, the the dog is drinking water. a bunch of water. Mm -hmm. it, not to bring that it's a burden for them to feel sorry for me, but I didn't want them to carry that burden anymore of feeling sorry. Oh, well, also, yeah, yeah, quickly, yeah. one thing that would always, honestly, it still bothers me to this day. <laughs> but like, well, maybe it probably didn't bother me in the first like couple of years or whatever, but now I don't know if anyone else feels like this. Like when you talk about Brian or like someone brings it up and they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh. I'm like, why, why are you saying sorry? I think like, about him all the time. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I, I feel like I have more or less found peace with it. And like, I'm comfortable talking about him yeah. or talking about his life. And people are like, I'm oh, sorry, we don't have to talk about it. Yeah, I like, think, no, I think other people are more uncomfortable yeah. than us. We're not the ones uncomfortable because well, other people they, are uncomfortable with topic of death. Yeah. We've lived through it. So we're, we like to talk about Brian. And I think they're afraid though, that they're going to hurt your feelings yeah. or bring well, something up nice. that you've forgotten. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Cause somebody said that to me once that, that went, cause her daughter went to school and I saw her with Brian in junior high elementary. And she said, I never know if I should say anything or not. And I said, oh, I always love, I always love to talk about But that. even to this day, people bring stuff up because when I was pregnant, I went to a labor and delivery for during oh. my pregnancy. And there was a nurse 10 years later that said, I have never told you this because I've never had the opportunity to speak to you, but told my mom that she was there that night. Like it's crazy. She was in the yeah. ER and the doctor from the ER at St. Anne's, the level three trauma center, Asked to ha asked to ride in the ambulance with him when he got transferred to to Toledo because he didn't want him to be alone in the ambulance and he kept trying to resuscitate him, which was which was against the policy. And I mean, to find out, to keep hearing even years later how hard some everybody worked to try to save him mm -hmm. yeah. is just a glowing mm -hmm. tribute to. To how great people really are. That I learned. People don't seem to care, and people go about their business, and you think they're they're arrogant or this, that, or the other, and you find out that there's a lot of pe people care. I think something that and we talk about this a lot, but with Brian dying, um, something you realize so much is the most inconsequential uh, interactions with other humans have a massive impact on those people. 
because even people who had very little interaction with Brian, just from one or two interactions, still came and would wait three hours in line for to tell you guys a story about how he was kind to them. And so people of it, being kind to someone, holding the door open for a random person or a small act of kindness, it does make a difference in people's lives because you know it takes something like that. You're you're obviously never almost most people are never going to get to know because you don't die and so you don't or you don't have someone around you die, but that was just such a recurring theme of just the power of small interactions or kindness. seemingly yes, small kindness. seemingly in, like inconsequential daily activities of just making someone laugh or this or that. Those make those those are everything. So. Smiling. Yeah. I had a couple of people tell me every time I saw Brian, he he had he'd get a big smile on his face. He would smile at people, and it's true. You reflect back. Or you you know what you give out is reflected back. Yeah. It, it it makes just a random person if you smile at them, it can make their day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, and back to what you said about people don't look at you like, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? We don't say how they feel. Like I'm. Because you don't want to bring people down. So well, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, that's it's awkward. And, I think and, you, and, and you wonder, like, do people really want to hear what? I mean, yeah, you already, they really want to hear what I. You, you already feel like a burden. So why? Yeah. So why would I go on? Especially if you like touch on mental health struggles and stuff, because I had my fair share. Um, I mean, I'm I feel like I'm a very candid person, but I try to be that way so that other people know, like they can talk to that you. they can talk to me. Like I'm not gonna judge you. Like I do not have room to judge. Um, and I think it just through like everything we've all been through, like it's kind of just a way to show, like I mean, your life could look perfect on paper mm -hmm. but it's to everyone you can't escape the human condition like like my dad said you can't money power status like not can escape from just the basic like, you can't escape grief you can't escape a lot of things um that are just gonna and happen don't you that think that it allows if you can be a little more honest about your emotions and your feelings without you know dragging everybody down don't you think that it makes other people feel feel as if maybe they could share a little bit of a burden instead of always being picture perfect mm -hmm. well everybody else well, is picture perfect picture except for me so i don't know if you guys have experienced this but for sure something i've experienced because people know that my brothers died and what i've been through i've been in, like had so many conversations and just that talk about things i've had so many people tell me like they then feel comfortable telling you about mm -hmm. their pain Right. So like people who have told me they've tried to kill themselves or people that bring up their different traumatic events or stuff like that, I feel like they're much more likely to share that with you. Well, when you show your vulnerability, other people will show their own yeah. vulnerability. Yeah. They have to well, know that you're not going to judge them and be, you know, um, or be okay well, to talk think, about yeah. it. Yeah. I think yeah. people that's, some, that's, sometimes, that's sometimes very hard. All that extra, you know, people telling you all that stuff because that then they're confiding that in you. Mm -hmm. So just being strong in that regard too. Um, and I think also like I mean we've all been open about Brian's death and stuff and like for example like when I was sixteen or something, I posted something on Instagram. It was like a screenshot from my notes app of an excerpt or something I wrote about World Suicide Prevention Day, and I kind of just was like, and this is Instagram where like. You're just supposed to post your cute pictures and stuff. Uh, but and I was how like, perfect your yeah. life is. But I um, posted this thing about like how I struggled with depression, anxiety, and like suicidal thoughts and things like this. And the amount of people that like DM me that I have never heard from like before, that were just like, I really appreciate this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because I mean, some people are gonna look at you like, oh, she's crazy. But other people will appreciate it. Yeah. And the people that are saying like, oh, she's crazy, are just like just too afraid. Yeah, they're just too afraid to. Let anyone let their guard down to anyone. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you guys have anything else? Uh, sorry, I was going to. Let's go ahead. So, yeah, I think and my dad already touched on this a little bit, but one major, like some major things I've like learned in life through grief and experiencing that is. <laughs> Sorry. It's the dog it's again. The dog, yeah, sorry. the dog gets restless and she starts rubbing against the couch. And making we can't, noises. We can't, we can't keep and we them can't out concentrate. Because, no, we can't keep them out either because they'll, they'll barge in. Yeah. So, so I would say a good way to maybe conclude this would be... Well, but back, oh, sorry. Back, back, okay, back, sorry, back, sorry. Back, sorry. Back, uh, so I think well, a major thing my dad touched on this a little bit is of lessons I've learned in life is 
just the importance of relationships. Once you lose someone so close to you, uh, a lot of other, you realize how like fickle a lot of other things are of people wanting to like, I need to like do this at school in order to like feel good. Or I need this car. I need money. Or I need uh, a significant other. I need this. You have to be happy with yourself and you have to be happy with the, like the, those around you and, and that it does mean everything. And another thing is I, sometimes I just pause just to wake up in the morning and um, like, like and just, and be alive is, is a true blessing because every day there's someone who doesn't wake up and there's people who are, are, are dying. And so it, it's truly a blessing to be alive and it's, it's cliche, but the small things and the people around you and the relationships mean everything so it just just uh, another reminder on that do you know what the priest who um married me and dad told me one time when i went out to lunch with him what he told me and i i have yet to do this on a consistent basis because i've always kept myself super busy and that i try to not think about it a lot that's been a coping mechanism in later years but he said to start a gratitude journal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because he told me it's nearly impossible to be angry, sad, grief-stricken, etc., when you sit down and you are grateful. And he told me every day you should think of three things that you're grateful for. And when you're when you ha practice an attitude of gratitude, it, mm. it those I mean it's, it's all about that attitude qu gratitude. quite um, what's the word trite, mm. but it's so true. It's about being consistent because I've done that. Yeah, I'll do that at times. I feel like lately I've been a lot better with everything. But the more you think, like, be grateful in your thoughts and writing things down, it really, it's hard to then uh, be angry about everything. Because, yes, there's always, could your life could be better and there could, there's always people with stuff mm -hmm. better than you. But the, more so than that, there's always people with it much worse than yeah. you. I, I always think about that, you know. And sometimes th that would be like a comparison. I'd be like, okay, I just lost my brother. There's people who have lost their, their entire, everyone. they've lost their entire families their or homes. Yeah, there, there's people. I mean, I think about it a lot of times. There's people who went to like World War II when they were 18, which I never had to do. Or just like people like now in the country that are not as free, I guess, or whatever. Yeah. So well, I, I think it'd be good. Wait, so, but can well, I say one more? Sure. Yeah. One thing that really, really helped. Well, just one more, and then you know. Tough. Because Kevin brought it up. Oh, I just think one thing that really motivated me when I was always super down to, like, whether it be about Brian or other things, I was like, and again, everything's relative, but I would always think, like, I, I look at everything I've been through, like, I have to keep going. Like, yeah. I've, every single time, what felt like I would never get through it, I got through it. Like, we never thought we'd get through Brian dying. I think we, we all want to die. Like, and so you just keep having things in your life and you're like, this feels unbearable and like, I will never get over this or I will never feel good again or be happy again. And then eventually. I think that's a really good yeah. point to, to then to remind yourself like, Oh, what, take a, a breath and zoom out. You're like, I've been through Brian. Yeah. Why, why am I getting worked up over this? Or why yeah. am I? So, Cause people think that point. life should be like this when really it's like this. Yeah, very much. So. Yeah. And, I you know, that things that I would be angry about, somehow I would be shown. Like, one time somebody at a talk said, oh, you, you, you thank God a lot. You thank God a lot. And she said it was a kid, you know, a young girl in high school. And, she, and that her classmates were trying to shush her because she was angry. And she was kind of yelling at me. And she said, what kind of God, you know, takes away somebody, a good person or, or your loved one? And I said, you know, I thank God that he took Brian and didn't let him live to be in a nursing home, in a coma, or paralyzed. The happy-go-lucky kid that I knew that was so athletic and so full of life, to have to, it was better to, to have him gone than to have to watch him in a bed, in a coma, or paralyzed from the neck down. Because that's kind of just like losing him anyways. Like, you know what I mean? You, like, just, I feel like with yeah. Eric, he probably had to grieve his old life because Eric never got to get married. Eric never, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Eric was never... Well, then you become a burden to people too. So. Yeah. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I also realized that we don't have a choice. Yeah, but you, so you, I mean, you I mean, as good. far as whether yeah. somebody lives you or can, dies. You or, can, and, and you can find good in... Everything. every situation and you can't control what happens in the world you can only 
very stoic Reactive thought that you can only control. Yeah, yeah, you can only control your reactions and control what you do. Like what therapeutic. So. So I felt like I wanted to be positive for Brian. Yeah. That was my best way, and I'm not always positive. I understand that, but that's the human condition. But that's my <laughs> best way of honoring Brian right. is trying to be positive. Mm-hmm. You yeah. Know? And just trying to be a little better each day. Just yeah. Continue. But all right, Dad. What? No, I was just saying whenever we're ready to wrap this up. But <laughs> yes, I think it'd be good for everybody just to say for people out there who may be going through a tragedy right now or have grief in their life, which a lot of people do. You know, what would be your one one bit of advice for people like that? And just we'll go around with oh, what's I- your yeah. So what would be your advice to someone who's going through a tragedy right now? Like what what do you think would be the I'm most sorry helpful advice you give that person so again as we said about the advice um you never know what i I think trying different things out and just seeing what works for you and i I think in your life you can you would probably know best of sometimes like the first when brian first died i remember an older person telling me like just eat whatever you like the most so at the time i like pizza rolls the most so that was the only thing i could stomach was i was eating these pizza rolls for breakfast before his funeral um or what made you the happiest where what was something you liked doing with that person? Maybe trying to do those things. And lastly, just the support system. So many people, your loved ones, friends, and other people or professional therapists are willing to talk through things with you and everything else. I, I think opening up or even just, you know, journaling, just so you, you have to get your thoughts out there. Um, so, and just kind of let it let it out so you can move kind of make sense of it and kind of go forward i mean i think my my best advice what helped me the most was the with your grief make some purpose out of it i mean don't let it destroy you um, do something positive with it so try to do something that can benefit others i think as you grow older and you become wise life is less about your material things but it's more about how you can help other people and there's so many things that you can do to make someone likes better and take your grief and your tragedy and turn it into something positive for somebody else. And, and I mean, that's the biggest thing that I think I took out of this whole death of my son. There was no reason to let him die without turning that death into something positive for others. And I think, I think we've done that, but um, that'd be my advice. Me? Um, I think the biggest thing that I allowed myself and give yourself the grace to have a bad day, to not always be positive, to cry, um, to feel like it'll never get better. Um, have the grace to just let yourself be. Mm-hmm. Um, because I realized that tomorrow, this is like Scarlett O'Hara said, tomorrow's another day. Didn't she say something like that? It's tomorrow's another day or something. Mm-hmm. I'm gone with the wind. Mm-hmm. But um, there were days where there were shit. And you know what? I let them be shit. I didn't try to keep going and forcing myself to be productive or happy. I would. That's when I would go up to his room and just lay there and let myself grieve and, you know, not worry about whether I got the laundry done. Um, I tried to, to be the best I could with giving food and taking care of you guys. But, um, you know, there were days where I just let it hang. And having, second thing is, um, having a friend or two that you, I mean, I, I used crying on my friend's shoulders so much. I had a couple of them that I really cried on and, uh, Amy Bucky was a rock for me. And she was just always there anytime when I wanted to talk. And that's the kind of friend you need to be when somebody's going through grief. Is just be there for them. Um, for me, I would say probably, in my opinion, like it won't hurt this bad forever. Um, I mean, yeah, it'll hurt, and you'll still feel it or think about it. But like Kevin said, at some point, or someone said, at some point, you have to force yourself to move on. Um, so, I mean, that's my attitude. I feel like I adopt in a lot of different scenarios when I'm hurting. It's just like, it won't always hurt this bad. The the pain right now is temporary. 
And, like, there's still pain there, but it's not, like, how it was. Um, so, yeah. Do you have any, does anyone have anything else? No. So, yeah, and, and we'll definitely, we didn't really touch on Brian Matters or any of that stuff, but we'll, we'll, so we'll, there'll definitely be more episodes where we talk about uh, other things involving Brian. Because, I mean, obviously that's a huge part of who we are and uh, what we've done in life in the years since. But uh, hopefully you guys got something out of this and uh, we appreciate you watching and listening. We appreciate the feedback uh, you've left. And yeah, uh, have tune a good in, one. Tune in for next Tune in next Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. Oh yeah, so with the, every, every Saturday, new episode every Saturday. So. Let All us right. know if you want any topics covered. I yeah. think a topic we definitely want to do is positivity because I think a lot of what we've done too is try to become more positive people. So I think that'd be a good episode. Yeah. How to become more positive. Yeah. I do. Uh, yeah. And my sister's coming home. Julie's coming home in a couple weeks. So we'll shoot yeah. an episode, a couple nice. episodes with her. And those Definitely. Days. She yeah. has a lot of uh, great thoughts and ideas. And she's, she also had made a post that she didn't want to be that uh, girl. She didn't want to be that girl who was, who, who was known she didn't want to be known as that girl whose brother died. Yeah. yeah. I think, and you said once that it was great when you went away to college because nobody there mm -hmm. knew mm -hmm. your history. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, definitely. Like, that was, when, yeah, when we were at home all the time, people would randomly be like, oh, wait, Catholic? No, like, yeah. didn't your brother die? And I was like, like, I've seen your parents work in my school. You, you don't want that to be your identity. <laughs> your, yeah, your identity. But, um, all, right. all right. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks. Have a good one.